This is the Christmas Movie Screenwriter Podcast, episode number 13. Hello and welcome to the Christmas Movie Screenwriter Podcast. I'm your host, Karen McCann. The Christmas Movie Screenwriter is a podcast about writing, producing, and selling Christmas movies. I publish a transcript with every episode in case you want to look at something or read it later. Just go to the website at www.christmasmoviescreenwriter.com and look for this episode, which is number 13. A quick few words about what I'm working on. Today, I will start contacting producers and acquisition execs regarding my newest script, which is called Merry Heistmas. I also created a newsletter where I'll include links to my latest podcast and blog. I'm also adding a new section called Karen's Corner. Here I'm going to write a mini journal about my journey of getting my Christmas scripts produced. If you'd like to be on my newsletter list, go ahead and sign up on my website's sign-up page for our membership club. I've already got the beats written for my next screenplay, which is a faith-based screenplay, told from a secular point of view. I should have that script outlined in the first draft ready in about two weeks, so I'm very excited to include news on that in my next newsletter, since it's completely outside my wheelhouse and it's a brand new thing for me. In today's interview, Australian-based producer, director Steve Jaggi discusses how writers need to understand each platform, such as Netflix, Hallmark, Lifetime, GAC, etc., their needs before you even begin to write your script. He also discusses streaming's impact on family Christmas movie viewing, which luckily translates into more opportunities for writers. He discusses the changing landscape for financing Christmas movies and an easy way for writers to figure out what producers want. Here is the main segment. Steve Jaggi, a Canadian-born Griffith Film School graduate, honed his talent in the UK before establishing his company in Brisbane, Australia. As a multi-actor Australian Academy of Cinema and Television Arts, AFI award-winning, and Logie-nominated film and television producer, Jaggi Entertainment has produced content for major platforms like Disney, Netflix, Paramount, Hallmark, Great American Family, and Lifetime. Recent successes include the Netflix series Dive Club and the global hit film Love is in the Air. Beyond his production company, Jaggi has showcased his creative prowess with acclaimed directorial works such as Chocolate Oyster, praised at the Sydney Film Festival and the documentary And the Beat Goes On, recognized by CNN's The Screening Room for its authentic portrayal of the Ibiza music scene. Well, Steve, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Now, I told the audience a little bit about you, but why don't you take a minute and tell us about yourself and your business? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, I don't know if I'm that exciting, really, but... Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're very exciting. Uh, and your uh, lifestyle, your photo, when the audience sees it, the lifestyle, the beaches, it looks oh, fascinating. <laughs> well, you know, I'm one of those people that I really love the mantra you know, you, you work to live, you don't live to work. So I really enjoy making movies, but I also enjoy, um, a good lifestyle. So I have kind of built a business out of making movies and far flung parts of the world that are really lovely. And, um, uh, as you said, when you're reading my bio, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, I've, I moved to Australia from Canada originally where a lot of TV movies are made and took that skill set and moved to Australia um, and I live, I have a cottage on the beach. Wow. Uh, my company is based uh, 10 minutes from the beach. Wow. And um, of course, we do a lot of Christmas movies, which I think is what we're talking about today. But for those um, of your audience, uh, you know, I've seen our, our catalog of work. You know, we, we're very fortunate. We make a lot of topical movies. We just did a, a very successful one for Netflix last year called Love is in the Air that was all shot up in the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, I sure ran a TV series for Netflix called Dive Club that was on the Great right. Barrier Reef as well. Right. So right. I get I get to shoot a lot on the reef and all the tropical areas and, you know, get to go diving, scuba diving and sailing and jet skiing and all the things I love doing. Uh, sounds wonderful. Maybe we'll see a Christmas surf movie from you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I'd, I'd love to. Uh, we're definitely trying to figure out how to, how to mix Christmas movies with the tropics for sure. <laughs> Very good. Now, 
Speaking of Christmas movies, what are some key elements that you look for in a Christmas screenplay that would motivate you to produce it, especially down under? Yeah, look, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, when we're looking at putting together a movie, really what we're starting with is working backwards from what the what the kind of what the platform is going to be you know who who is the audience where are they going to watch the movie because at the moment there are a couple kind of key broadcasters as you were that would would air christmas movies we all know hallmark great american family is a big player in that space now as well netflix and amazon are also in that space uh lifetime is in that space so it, i think it really behooves anyone to really understand who the audience is and whom is going to be broadcasting the movie, especially domestically in the U S and in Canada, because they all have different um, positions in the marketplace and they all have different, slightly different audiences that they're going for. And um, if, if the film isn't the right fit for one of those buyers, you're going to have a real hard time getting it off the ground. So what we do is we we make movies for most of the we've made movies uh, recently. We've done a lot for Great American Family, done a number of movies for Hallmark, done a number of movies for Lifetime, done a lot for Netflix. So we will start off by, um, you know, we'll start off with a platform in mind and an audience in mind. We know the audience that the different broadcasters or platforms are going for. Um, and that will really influence the type of story that we're looking for um, in terms of the storytelling in terms of where the film is set in terms of the tone of the story. Um, some of those buyers I mentioned are looking for more progressive stories. Some of them are looking for more traditional heartland value stories. Um, and, and the marketplace is shifting as well. It's very much, um, very much every, every six months it, it's changing mm. a lot and particularly in America and particularly now that we have an election coming up, right. you know, it really, uh, really makes a big difference because um, it's a very polarized marketplace with, um, so it's, it's just, it's, I'm speaking with my evil business head on now more so than, than kind of a writer or director may, but um, yeah, it really, it really, it really is important to understand who's going to watch the movie before embarking on making creative decisions. Now, uh, let me, let me just follow up on something. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I love the evil business. <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> um, I I understand the the audience for GAC Great American Family is yeah a li little bit separate from Hallmark Lifetime and Netflix. But can you? Is this a trade secret? Trade secret to kind of tell the audience how the audiences differ for those three networks: Hallmark Lifetime. No, I, I, don't, and I don't think so. I think it's it's pretty broadly published. Um, I will also say if, 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 I mean, I, I'm assuming that a lot of your audience is probably, um, people who are either filmmakers or writers or, or right. aspiring right. writers and filmmakers, uh, as well as of course, fans of the genre, uh, it would definitely, I will say to you right now that, um, the platforms are changing, like the audience is evolving or the audience that they're going after because we are, this is a business. And so, uh, each platform is looking for a unique take on the genre for an audience to, whom they can sell advertising slots. That's what it all comes down to. Okay. Right. If it pull, it's not have any pretense here. It's down to, if there's no money, there's no business. And then nobody's commissioning movies. So gone are the days because of the segregation of the, of the marketplace in terms of, um, that's the wrong word to use apologies, but, um, because yeah, yeah. of the, uh, the, 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 I'm trying to think of the, the correct word here to use. Um, uh, the, 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 because you've now got, um, um, the marketplace is fragmented, fragmented. Right. That's, um, yeah. Yeah. The, 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 um, uh, you now have a number of, like let's say, call, call them the five players I just spoke about. They each are going for a slightly different take on, on an audience. So if we rewound 10 years, the major, uh, uh platform or, or broadcaster was Hallmark and Hallmark caught everyone. It caught grandmother, mother, and, and kids. So it was like a, almost four quadrant. Like you'd have most of the family sitting down uh, or maybe the whole family enjoying a Hallmark movie for Christmas. And I certainly remember when I was a kid, I would sit down with my mother sometimes father, but definitely my sister and I, my mother would sit down and we would enjoy Hallmark movies for Christmas. That was de facto growing up in the nineties. That's what it was. And you'd never question that in a million years. Obviously streaming came along and broke that whole model. And now right. uh, within, within a household, you might have mom, dad, and two kids, right? A traditional nuclear right. family. Uh, 
as an example, uh, and they're now watching four different movies on four different platforms, right? Even though right. they're all Christmas movies, right. that's the reality of what's happening. So now, what you see is more movies being made, usually at a lesser budget, not always. Usually, you have more movies being made at a lesser budget because the demand is four times as much as it was before. Wow! Because there's now all these devices and all these channels. As a consequence, the broadcasters, the Hallmarks and and, and the Gax and the Lifetimes, they're chasing advertising dollars, and the mm-hmm. Netflix and the Amazons, they're chasing subscribers. So it, it, it's very important for all of them to speak to an audience that will come there to either pay a subscription or that will have enough audience numbers to convince somebody to buy an advertising slot. Um, so that's the state of play. And then each, and so as a consequence, each broadcaster has a slightly different spin on the genre because they're going for that different audience type. So um, Great American Family are a, a big, they're the fastest growing network in America right now. They have a very strong wow. business model. Um, the CEO of that um, um, uh, uh, um, that broadcaster used to be the CEO of Hallmark. So, right, right. Uh, you know, they've taken a lot of key work learnings and are doing a lot of the kind of content that Hallmark used to do 10 years ago. Big audience for that. Hallmark obviously have moved in a different direction um, and they are um, making content that is now more socially uh, conscious. Um, and then obviously Netflix have a very different audience as well. Um, and then Amazon as well are differentiating themselves from Netflix. And then also Lifetime have a very different USP um, as well. So they're all, they all have a different nuance and the commissioning, uh, the commissioning editors, as it were, at each. So the way each network works is they have a commissioning team that are looking to commission content or acquire content that comes from producers. Okay. And yeah. well, hope that makes sense. It's no, a bit confusing, it does. Very confusing. It does. <laughs> it does. But I'm, yeah. I'm just wondering if you're a, if for the writers out there, if they're going to target, mm-hmm. you know, I know with some of these companies, it's like, uh, who is it? Netflix or whoever. It's like, <laughs> good luck breaking in without, yeah. you know, an a, a, a arm, a, a dozen credits to your name. Um, yeah. But if a, a writer is out there and saying, well, I want to target Hallmark and Lifetime and Netflix, I'm going to, I I have a Christmas movie, so I'm yeah. just going to reach out to all of them because yeah. they all so, make Christmas movies. No. Absolutely not. Uh, that will just infuriate them all. Also, um, <laughs> okay. you got to remember, none of them. So here's a, a, a trick that nobody ever tells anyone. That none of the, even though the networks, all of them will brand it as an original. None of them make the content, right? It's right. it's a production company that makes the content. So your best bet as a writer, you need to pitch and you need to get a producer to acquire the material or license it or option it, and then the production company will then go and shop it to various networks because the production company or or, or their intermediary some work also with sales partners um mm-hmm. that's also a separate dynamic i don't have to get into but but we'll just roll all up into the producer the producer is the one with the the contact with the network and again the network the bigger networks might have three or four or five commissioning uh, commissioning editors or you know commissioning positions mm-hmm. and they will have relationships with four or five production companies and so you'll see if you I won't give the game away completely, but if you look at my company and IMDb or some of the other companies that you're well, like if your audience just thinks of choose five of your favorite Christmas movies last year and then go into IMDb and look at who made them, look right. at the producers, look at the production company. So right. even though it'll have been billed as an original for that broadcaster, it will not be. It'll be a production company that made it. And then right. you look at the production company, you'll see that production company won't make films for everyone normally. They will have a relationship and they'll have a relationship with Hallmark and have done two dozen for Hallmark or a relationship with Netflix, you know, so right, right. That, and so you get to, as a writer, you, you need to understand who the different produce, producers are and production companies are and who they're targeting. Cause very few production companies are targeting all five major right. broadcasters. It's too right. difficult. They'll have good relationships with a couple of the broadcasters and then they will, hopefully if they're a good, if they're a good producer, they will have that relationship. They'll know what the broadcaster is looking for and they will make, you know, multiple movies a year for that particular platform i've heard a quote a while ago last year there was it, it sounds unbelievable 170 christmas movies were made now other oh. other other statistics say 115 yeah. so i don't know the real number i would say it must be more than that i would say to you that's probably just one or two broadcasters because you're also we're just talking domestic right now that's right you've got a factor and when we say domestic for those who don't know domestic in the sense of the film business means america and canada 
they get bundled together. So it doesn't mean the rest of the world. Now, Europe also. So we did a film, a Christmas movie that I loved a couple of years ago. It's called Mistletoe Ranch. And mm. it was a beautiful, beautiful film, but it was probably a bit too artistic because it, it would cross the line to being a bit more theatrical than TV movie. So mm. at first it didn't really sell too well in America, but it did gangbusters in Europe. Wow. And it taught me a valuable lesson that the European market can be as valuable as the American market. So that's great. That 170 a year, and I think it's probably more than that, that's just domestic. Then wow. you've also got you've got um Europe, Europe as well. And then you've got Australia, New Zealand, smaller territories. And then then you also have a growing market in Southeast Asia with Korea, Japan. But I would say it's it's harder to get our Christmas movies over there because right. they have different sort of traditions. Right, but certainly, right. certainly, certainly the, the, the market for Christmas movies and post-COVID, where you know people are looking for more and more uplifting content. Um right, right. Christmas movies just continue to grow. Yeah. I'm happy to hear the demand that. For them, sorry. I'm, I'm happy yeah. to hear <laughs> that. Yeah. Now, uh about Christmas movies, some critics say yes. that Christmas movies are formulaic. How can writers make their scripts stand out? Great question. So again, this comes down to why it's so important from day one to understand who you're writing the film for. Because there are certain platforms, and again, I'm not going to say which is which because I have relationships with a number of them. I don't want to offend anyone. Right. Um, and I rely, my company relies on selling to a number of these different buyers. But there are some who we all know that are looking for Christmas movies that are going to represent a modern experience. So if we're just talking domestic and we're talking that your writers are going to come from the, the US or Canada at the moment, and it's for a domestic audience. Um, the first question is, who is the film speaking to? Is it speaking to a modern um, uh, uh, family? Um, or is it speaking to a more traditional um, uh, audience that are looking for, you know, kind of uh, a, a, a more value-led um, right, right. story versus right. a story which is maybe a bit more progressive? It's very important to know that from the very beginning because right. it, immediately you you have to choose one or the other and you're immediately cutting off half the buyers. And Whoa. that's not – by the way, plenty of writers – Right. Almost all writers and directors write movies for both. So I've, I've seen, I've had plenty of feedback where we do movies for one certain buyer and, and people will mistakenly think that the writers and the, and oh, the actors, in fact, fans often think, oh, actors will only work for one network. Not at all. They will go to the highest paycheck. It's the same with directors, the same with writers. Right. So, so as a writer, you have to be able to write for any network because you need to make a living. Right. Um, But you need to understand before you start writing your script who the audience is, um, because there's no point submitting a uh, really progressive script to a, a network that um, is focusing on family values. Conversely, right. there's no point writing a script that is very family values oriented and then presenting it to Netflix because it will not get any traction. Right. Yeah. G- good point. Now, how no, hopefully, do you, hopefully that helps. No, no, it does. Really, it does. It does. Now, how do you find scripts? Do you tend to hire a WGA writer? I know you're in Australia, but um, mm-hmm. or you, uh, let me rephrase that. Do you tend to hire union writers or non-union writers? Yeah, so a great, great question. Um, it, it it doesn't make a huge. We do both. Um, it, it's it's it is a larger challenge if you are a production company based within the United States or Canada, we are not, although we do a lot of work there and we have produced movies in both countries, but the, we are legally registered in Australia. So um, it's, it's not as big a concern for us. Um, really it, it, it's a multi-tiered in that um, obviously when writers are starting out, it's harder for them to get into the union. I'm not, not by any stretch of imagination, um, an expert on how one gets into the WGA or, or the, I think the WGC, um, which is the same in Canada, but um, mm-hmm. they're, they're basically when a network commissions a movie, it'll be at a certain price point and certain movies, once it reaches a certain price threshold, will have union writers writing union scripts because they're all union films, but there is a, a large portion of the marketplace where the films are below that threshold and those fees aren't available. And I um, am not au fait as to the rules that because different countries have different unions and in some countries um, union writers can go below the union fee. If the film is like say an indie film or if the union agrees that it can be low budget, 
I don't think that's the case in America, but I could stand corrected. Um, but the different networks have different tiers of budgets. And so the, 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 the standing of the writer and whether a writer is union or not, union or not sorry, um, will very much come down to the actual budget of the film. I can tell you from a producer's perspective, we obviously want to work with the most experienced writers we can find, usually union writers, but it's not our call in the sense that when we, when you do a deal with a writer, the writer's fee is baked into the budget. And then that, that budget, obviously we look to the, the broadcasters buying the film to give us the budget. So the, the, the producer doesn't make any more money if the writer's union or not union. There's often mm-hmm. that misconception um, okay. that the producer's fee is kind of locked in. So, so it's, 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 it's entirely down to who the broadcaster is and how much they want to spend on the movie. Is, uh, now, in America, the WGA, there are different tiers of budgets that a union writer can work on. There's the micro budget, there's the, the low budget, there's and there's there's a number. I think I mm. can't remember. It's like two thousand two million point five million for low budget, and I forget what micro budget is. Um, is that is there a rule of thumb that says okay, anything over two million is union writers, or is it sort of like it's every case is different. Yeah, every every case is different, and um, it also depends who the buyer is. So we, sometimes we will make a movie that doesn't shoot in America, but it has a WGA writer, and it's specifically commissioned by an American broadcaster. In which case, um, then it's all a union contract. Other times we'll make a film that is sold to uh, uh, Germany or France. Um, uh, and so it's not a union contract, but we'll honor the union fees. It's, it's, oh. It is quite convoluted. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it is quite convoluted. But I, I would say to you, hand and heart, if you're a writer and you're looking at a production company and that production company does at least, you know, they've done 10 plus movies for reputable broadcasters, it's always above board. And, and, mm-hmm. and because it, it's, it's, it's at the end of the day. It's just too difficult if you if you cross anyone. So every, and like I say, right. the producer doesn't make any more money or any less money, uh, no matter which way it goes. So the producer is always just trying to find the path of least resistance. That's good to hear. I I, I wasn't aware of that. So thank you for enlightening me. <laughs> now speaking of money, what is your ideal budget for a Christmas TV movie? As much as possible. No, no, really great. <laughs> well, because just like a writer, our fees are based on a percentage. Again, there's a misconception as to how producers work. Um, gone are the days of, you know, um, producers getting filthy rich and buying luxury yachts. Um, <laughs> you know, now a producer, you know, you go into a broadcaster or a streaming service, the producer's fee is capped and it's a percentage of the movie, just like a director or a um, writer. So it, everyone wants the film to be as big as possible because everybody gets the biggest paycheck. Um, right. it, different, again, different buyers have different budgets and I got to be careful what I say here. So I'm not going to talk about any particular buyer, but right. I will right. say to you right now, the budgets are a lot smaller than the public think they are. Okay. Yep. That that's, I've heard that on from different guests. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you have a budget in mind. That goes to my next question. How do you finance your Christmas movies or are the, are these buyers, financing them yeah so um in the olden days when i started and i've been doing this professionally now for uh, i don't know 12 or 13 years can show my age um i i was i was when i started the first company i worked for um they would go and sell directly to one buyer one broadcaster who would pay the entire fee for the movie make the movie that that was the way it was that's almost gone completely if you're very lucky there are one or two buyers that will still do that do that but the buyers are very very savvy so they they know now that about tax credits so there's an expectation that at least 30 percent, but sometimes 50 percent of the movie should be paid for by tax credits and foreign sales so as a producer if we find a u.s broadcaster that's going to put up half of the money then i think that is a good deal like i because all the broadcasters know that between tax credits and foreign sales, the rest of the money is there. So they're they're trying to put in as little as possible, and you're trying to get as much as possible. So really, you, you, a producer now, a producer's job is very different than what it used to be. The producer uh, Producing is not just finding a good script and finding a good director. The producer needs to weave together the finance for the movie, which will require a bank loan, and you'll be borrowing against the sale to a broadcaster because the broadcasters don't pay you the money until you deliver the film and you've got foreign sales and you'll have tax credits and it all 
kind of linking together. That, that sort, you sort of uh, almost answered my next question, but let me just rephrase it. How do you market and monetize your Christmas movies? Do you utilize sales estimates to attract sales agents? And what strategies do you employ to recoup your investment? If you could expand mm-hmm. on that. Yeah. So most companies, like we're kind of a medium-sized company. So we, for context, we just seven romances last year, not all Christmas, but I think we have three of the seven as Christmas movies. Um, so we're, I'd say a medium sized company. Some companies are doing 20 to 25 movies a year. And a lot of companies do say two movies a year. Um, a company, our size, we do work with a sales agent because there are so many buyers around the world. We could not possibly meet them all. I I have personal relationships with several of the major buyers, but we could never meet them all. So we have an excellent relationship with a, a, a U.S. sales company who we have an output deal with that, that means that. They have basically all of our TV movies. We 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 partner with them on, um, and we often co-finance together. And they will be out there selling the movies um, on behalf of our partnership. And then my responsibility is to oversee the making of the movie, and I also oversee the financing of the movie. Um, and then their responsibility is to travel around the world, you know, three hundred sixty-five days a year, trying to sell said movies um, to the fifty-two territories around the world that will buy them. And you need sales estimates, obviously, or they they provide those that your sales partner would do that. You don't really need sales estimates. It depends on how you're financing a movie. Um, sales estimates, um, I mean, basically all the different broadcasters normally pay a set amount for the movie. So you pretty you pretty much know what it's going to sell for unless you have a kind of very particular element, like it's a theatrical title or you have a really big movie star in it. Um, you pretty much know what it's going to sell for. So my... Our business, we don't rely on sales estimates, um, okay. but we do have the volume, and we ha- we have like uh, our the banks that we have key relationships with, kind of know from our track record what each film will make. I guess if you were starting out, you would probably need to get sales estimates to then go off to a private investor to get them to lend you money against the sales estimates. Okay. Now, how important is originality in a Christmas TV movie script? And what advice would you give screenwriters looking to put a unique spin on a well-loved holiday theme or trope? My answer is going to be an evil producer's answer. (laughs) It really depends on who the buyer is. So there are some networks that really love originality, and there are some networks that don't. And I will not say which network is which, because I will shoot myself in the foot. (laughs) It would really... Uh, I would really recommend to aspiring writers to go and watch, you know, you, I've already told you who the five networks are the, by these movies right, right, right. Uh, in in America. Um, go and watch five movies from each network, you know, uh, uh, from last Christmas. And you will, you will learn very quickly the types of more movies they're after. Um, certain audiences want repetitive because they, they, they are looking for feelings of, you know, they, they want to feel like they're, um, um, they want to feel safe and comfortable. And there are certain audience segments that want to be challenged. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, different different platforms are looking for different types of stories. Okay. Now, what advice would you give to your younger self about producing Christmas movies? What would that be? I mean, I'd say don't do it, but I wouldn't listen <laughs> to myself. <laughs> um, I think... I would say Christmas movies are amongst the most fun movies to make. So we really, my company, we all love making them. Um, It's great. Like we, we have snow machines and we're using real snow. A a little, I'm sure you've already heard this from other guests. Christmas movies are always made out of season. They're made six months in advance. So when I lived in Canada, you know, we were making Christmas movies in the summer. Now that I'm living in Australia, my company is here. um, We, we make movies during the Australian winter and, for those of you that don't know, I didn't know this until I moved to Australia. Australia is a continent within it. It's the size of the continental US. So Australia has mountains and snow and skiing. Just nobody really realizes that because they just think about the tropical part, which is the northern part. So when we're shooting Christmas movies, we can we can shoot a big competitive advantage we have is our Christmas, our Christmas movies that shoot June, July, August shoot in the winter. Whereas in North America, they're shooting in the summer. So for us, we we have snow machines and all that stuff, but we inherently are cold. We in, we inherently not super cold. It's not it's not as cold as it would be in you know uh, uh, Michigan or, or or Saskatchewan or, or Vancouver. Well, we're probably about the same temperature as Vancouver. So it's it's chilly, and you can wear your thick coats. Um, and then we just augment it with snow. So. Um, but, but Christmas movies are so much fun to make, um, from a purely a craft point of view in terms of 
art department and wardrobe and costume and um and then and then actors love working in them and 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 the creatives so the writers and directors love making christmas movies as well and what about a tropical christmas movie oh look i we've been trying yeah i mean that's we'd love to make those um okay. i think it's it's a little harder because again going back to who the audience is a lot of not all but a lot of the different audiences that want to watch christmas movies in the northern hemisphere want to see their own christmas experience yes, reflected on screen that's true. and so for most people christmas well and we're not even going to talk about climate change <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. you know put that to one side <laughs> most people in their head have a vision of christmas being this thick blanket of snow and right. it's really romantic and right. cozy and cheesy jumpers and uh, sweaters sorry and and yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know being inside with a roaring fire that obviously is not the case if you're tropical um so um we we are you know we are acutely aware that most of our audience is looking for um that feeling of safety and comfort that they get from you know revisiting the christmas experiences that they've had in their in their you know in their childhood or youth okay well, I still think a Christmas surfer movie is. <laughs> oh, I promise you, we'll do fun. it. We're, we're, it's gonna, it's gonna happen. Yeah. Okay, yeah, writers, yeah, we're just find writers the right out there, you got to write that Christmas yeah, surfer yeah. shirts well, I, up. I, I would definitely say one thing. I, I should touch on one of your previous questions. I'd highly recommend writers to do is finding some movies that they enjoy and that they they think you know, looking at who makes those movies and and if if as a writer you feel that your voice is because not even though I say you should be writing films for every, every, every broadcast or every platform, I realize that's not always possible because what right. makes writers special right. is that their unique voice and life experience. I, I would really recommend to writers before they submit just writing scripts and sending them off meeting with producers and asking the producers what they're after. And, and the easy way to do that, I can promise you this right now, producers will almost always meet with writers. It's very hard to get Hallmark to meet with you or Netflix to meet with you. They don't want to. But that's because they're not the ones making the movie. But the producers will because nobody ever wants to talk to producers. So find five of your favorite Christmas movies from last year. Reach out to those producers. Don't pitch them anything. Just offer to take them for a coffee or, you know, in my case, I'm addicted to bubble tea. So if somebody says to me, hey, I'm an emerging writer uh, and I'll take you for bubble tea. You know what? I will almost always say yes. That's and cool. um the producer will just tell you. The producer's going to be honest with you and say, hey, we make movies for X, Y, and Z, and this is what they're looking for. And that they will tell you what to write. Wow. That mm -hmm. is great. Because I think the problem with writers, and it's so much work to write a script. Yes. I mean, it could take you one month. It could take you a year. It could take you longer. Yes. And then to yeah. turn out, no one wants it. What a waste. Exactly. Don't even, yeah, don't even, don't even, I would highly recommend n n not, I mean, you might, I'm not, I'm not a writer myself. And so I appreciate from a, a journey perspective in terms of skill set, you may want to write some spec scri scripts to make sure that right, of course. You, you're at a skill set level that, you know, right. it's it, your, your, your work is right. But in terms of when you're going to actually go for the jugular and say, okay, I'm ready now to make money doing this. I want to write something that's going to sell. I, I would highly recommend to you um apologies i'd highly recommend to you meeting up uh with some producers and and yeah asking them what they're after because they'll tell you they'll, they'll tell you exactly what they're after i hope so i hope so because sometimes it seems like this is a black box and writers are like blind and and, yeah. it, and sometimes i feel like you know talking to a couple of writers on the podcast it's like oh this trade secret secret what this studio wants or what this network wants and and they're not telling anyone they obviously can't they without never it, yeah of course yeah. so but you're saying go to the producer a, pro a production company that has some agreement with these streamers or whoever and take them to lunch or coffee or whatever and just say hey what are you looking for Okay. I great. promise you, they'll tell you exactly. Uh, what okay, for. I am going to take you up on that. I am going to, <laughs> I'm going to do that. So I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that. Okay. So, what is the best way for screenwriters to connect with you and submit their ideas or scripts? Great question. So, um, my company again, like being a medium-sized company, um, another helpful t hint is that we have a development team. So I own the company, um, but I am probably the worst person to contact because I, I'm. I have crippling anxiety over just keeping the company afloat and paying all my staff. So my, all I'm focusing on, which is again, evil producer talk, I'm just focused <laughs> on making sure that we're making enough to pay everyone. Um, that is unfortunately Good. the curse of being a producer. No, so I have a, I have a development department. I've got two people in development. Um, 
uh, uh, Sophie Chilson um, and Drishti Sony, and that is their job is to work with writers and source material. So every company has a development person or development team. Find out who's doing development. Don't go for the CEO of the company. They're going to be too busy and they'll never respond to your email. Look at a company. Usually it's listed on their website or it's going to be on um, a, a kind of an industry site. It'll list all the different people who are there. And um, yeah, just uh, um, um, find a development person and meet with the development person because they also, they'll talk your language. The development person will talk about script. They'll talk about pathos. They'll talk about character all day long. Uh, mm-hmm. A producer themselves, unless they're a very small outfit where it's just one or two producers, um, the producer themselves is oh, just going to be stressing constantly about like, oh, I've got to feed the beast. I've got to right. I do X number right. of movies. I've got to make sure my right. staff are paid. I've got, and they're dealing with casting like movie stars. Movie stars have, you know, a lot of challenges about dealing with agents and this and that and unions. And they're not paying a lot of attention to meeting new writers. Okay. Got it. That, well, that is that is good advice. Now, to uh, wrap up, would you like to share any social media links or website details so our audience can keep track of your work? Oh, well, I mean, our website, uh, jaggyentertainment.com, lists, I think, all of our movies. Um, otherwise, I always we're always keen to hear from people who have watched our films. Um, uh, uh, the, we're, we had a big success last year with um, a film called Love is in the Air on Netflix. That was a okay. big kind of global success for us. Um, we also had a great film on Hallmark called When Love Springs. Uh, then a number of films that we're really proud of with Great American Family. Um, uh, One Perfect Match stands out, probably is my favorite. Um, from a Christmas movie perspective, uh, I think um, Designing Christmas uh, with Great American Family was uh, one of two films we did for them last year. Um, the one was Christmas Keepsake, both great films. Um, I would highly recommend Mistletoe Ranch, which I okay. think is now available in the U.S. on Hulu. Um, that that's an example of a film that's very quite artsy and quite socially conscious in the mm-hmm. Christmas movie space. Um, that went to a different set of buyers, but you know, depending on where writers sit, it, the films I just mentioned are on all different, you know, kind of um, parts of the spectrum. You know, from right wing to left wing. Great. Well, this is great, Steve. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your experience and no, all this, all this actionable advice. And I, it was great. I learned a lot. So thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. We'll see you soon. I hope. And maybe if sounds good, I'll, I'll write that Christmas surf movie. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Sounds great. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And now for my takeaways today, I have six. Number one, understanding platform needs. Steve discussed the key elements for producing a successful Christmas movie. He emphasized the importance of understanding the platform and audience before making creative decisions. He highlighted that the audience for different broadcasters, such as Hallmark, Lifetime, and Netflix, are distinct, and that each platform seeks a unique take on the genre for their audience. Number two, streaming's impact on family Christmas movie viewing. Steve also discussed the evolution of family Christmas movie viewing, noting the shift from a single shared viewing experience to a more individualized one. This, however, has led to the increase in the production of movies, which is a big bonus for writers. Number three, Christmas movie scripts and the target audience. Steve discussed the process of content creation and distribution in the film industry. He emphasized the importance of writers understanding the target audience and creating scripts that align with the values and preferences of the networks. He also noted that the market for Christmas movies is growing with potential opportunities in Europe and Southeast Asia. Number four, production companies' writer hiring practices. During the interview, Steve discussed the hiring of writers for productions. He clarified that the writer's fee is fixed and included in the budget and the decision to use union or non-union writers is not determined by the producer's fee. Number five, Christmas movie budgeting and financing. Steve shared that the financing process for Christmas movies has evolved with producers now needing to secure funding from various sources, including tax credits, foreign sales, and bank loans. And number six, connect with producers for script success. Steve advised writers to connect with producers to understand their needs before submitting scripts, suggesting they find producers of their favorite Christmas movies from the previous year. Well, that's the show. To show your support, please give us a five-star rating on Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. Writers, producers, and sales execs, sign up to be notified of the launch of our future membership website. 
This is where writers will have the opportunity to pitch producers and sales execs their Christmas scripts. Members will also get access to my newsletter, which I mentioned earlier, which will feature my mini journal of my journey of getting my Christmas script produced. Also, we'll have fresh content for our latest podcast and blog. Just go to www.christmasmoviescreenwriter.com and look for the sign up button in the toolbar. I'd like to take the opportunity to give a shout out to the writers, producers, and sales execs who recently signed up for our future membership service. Hope, thank you, Hope. Bev, thank you, Bev. Lisa, thank you, Lisa. Suzanne, thank you, Suzanne. Susan, thanks, Susan. Rebecca, thank you, Rebecca. Jennifer, thanks, Jennifer. Peter, thank you, Peter. Carol, thank you, Carol. Julie, thank you, Julie. Tracy, thank you, Tracy. And Ruby, thank you, Ruby. On the next episode of the podcast, I talk with Sapna Vyas, who serves as Vice President of Scripted Content for Lifetime. So stay tuned for that interview. That's the show. I'm your host, Karen McCann. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you on the next Christmas Movie Screenwriter Podcast. Bye.